Welcome back to Revolution and Ideology. I am Nick, joined as always by Jared, and today we are exploring how general strikes became illegal in the United States. So let's jump right in. Why don't you tell us what is a strike? A strike is an organized effort by workers to cease all forms of labor for political, economic, or social aims and or to improve work conditions to include pay, safety, benefits, hours. Um, If we want a little bit more formal definition, we can go to Oxford Dictionary, uh, which states a concerted cessation of work on the part of a body of workers for the purpose of obtaining some concession from the employer or employers, formally, sometimes more explicitly, a strike of work. Good. So I think that Most people, when they think of strikes, imagine like miners or railroad workers in like the 1800s. But the first strikes happened long before that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So we're going to be a little bit guilty of 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 using Western civilization examples here um, just because we want this to be quick. But essentially, the first strike dates all the way back to 1170 BCE in Egypt under Pharaoh Ramses III. Um, long story short, some of his artisans received insufficient rations for months. So in protest, they laid down their tools until eventually they received their promised compensation. So in the most simple of terms, that was a strike. Uh, another good example took place, um, during the Roman Republic, not necessarily the empire. It was known as the Sessio Puebus, which took place during the conflict of the orders in Rome. Those lasted about 494 to 287 BCE. Um, Without going into too much depth, um, the plebeians would essentially abandon the city, i.e. Rome, in mass, and they would go on protest, which means all of the shops, all of the workshops, um, all commercial transactions basically ceased. Eventually, through these actions, and they took place more than one time, they were able to uh, receive slow recognition um, in the political system. Uh, First, they were awarded uh, the ability to marry between the different classes so they could marry into the patrician class. Uh, They got validation of certain tribunes or councils. Um, They were also given uh, election to certain offices, not necessarily the highest ones, not in the Senate, at least not yet. Um, And they were allowed to petition the Senate for redress of their uh, uh, grievances. This led to, and I'm going to mispronounce this, so I guess someone correct me in the comments. I know someone will, but essentially the Licinio Sextian Rogations of 367 BCE, which eventually gave them a full consulate position, which is actually huge. I mean, it it didn't give them a majority um, within the Republic, but the fact that a plebeian could have a consulate position, that was a huge victory. Um, And eventually the Lex Hortensia in 287 BCE granted the plebeians something known as the Concilium plebis, which is basically a council of plebeians that also got to begin to introduce legislation. So that was huge. So how does a general strike differ from a regular strike? So essentially, a general strike ups the ante. Uh, They basically seek to cross specific professional, industrial, sectarian, class, gender, racial, and other constructed constructed identity-based lines. They basically are seeking to create solidarity, which we'll get to in just a second. Aside from work stoppage, workers also stop consuming. And that's the other big part of the general strike. It's not just about labor. It's also to stop consumption, hitting those that exploit them basically on both ends of the proverbial economic um, equation. It's also often accompanied by protests, marches, sit-ins, and mostly other nonviolent forms of civil disobedience. Again, we'll hit up Oxford here for just a second. Um, They say it's a strike of all the workers of one industry, a concerted strike by workers in all or most of the important trades and occupations of a country with a view to securing some common object by the stoppage of business. So in this case, it's both like employment based, but also social movement based. It's, It's essentially there is a political aspect to it. Um. Also, we must talk real briefly about solidarity strikes, which are basically similar to the above, though those now tend to cross national or state boundaries. What are some of the examples of effective strikes throughout United States history? Um, I mean, there's been been a whole bunch. We're going to focus on some of the older ones because that's where a lot of inspiration was drawn from. So the first um, work stoppages actually took place on plantations. They were called slowdowns back then, and it was when enslaved African Americans essentially organized through code talking on the plantations and even songs. This is where actually things like blues and jazz came from. They started way back on plantations through code talking and songs. 
um, singing under the watch of overseers, they basically organize themselves to, at the bare minimum, slow down production, if not outright bring it to a complete halt. So oftentimes when we talk about the history of labor movements in the United States, this one's left off for reasons I don't have necessarily time to get through, but I would say low key like racism um, that, I mean, it essentially just needs to be discussed a lot more than it already is. Like the slowdowns on slave plantations set a template for other movements. So for example, another movement that took place um, around the same time period, a little bit later, took place during the War for Independence. The Daughters of Liberty brought into the uh, fold this idea of non-consumption. Uh, we have a whole section on this in our Myth is America series. We'll probably link it in the show notes um, below. But regardless, the Daughters of Liberty essentially stopped consuming um, British products, um, essentially hitting them in the wallet. But it also brought into the, the, the fold this idea of independently making those products for themselves, i.e. separating themselves economically from the British. So things like tea um, or even clothes, those were big parts of what the Daughters of Liberty were able to introduce um, during this era of non-consumption. Another good example, um, shortly after the independence of the United States, were the Lowell Mill Girls of 1834 and 1836. Uh, we have an entire standalone episode on them, so we'll link that um, actually below as well. So I just wanted to give them a brief mention on what they were able to do in the textile mills. 1892 is the next one I want to talk about, the Homestead Act, or the Homestead, well, the Homestead um, strike, and then essentially, it's definitely not the act, but essentially the um, actions then engaged in by the owner, Andrew Carnegie, hiring the Pinkertons, and then of course the Fed eventually has to come in. And and even though it, we could argue, it's not even really an argument, that the strike didn't necessarily work in favor of the workers, the fact that it took place at all began to kind of breed a culture of fear among those that, among the elite classes like the Andrew Carnegie's and the Rockefellers and the J.P. Morgans and the Jay Goulds and so on and so forth during this quote unquote gilded age. Just two years after, we have another one of the most famous strikes in U.S. history. It's called the 1894 Pullman Strike. Essentially, George Pullman has his own town just outside of uh, Chicago or basically part of Chicago at this more, uh, moment in time. And um, what they would produce is basically rail cars. Essentially, though, Eugene Debs, very famous um, um, labor advocate, uh, steps in and um, extends the strike to include basically all facets of like railroad production. And this was actually shut down by the Fed as well. So it doesn't necessarily work, but the fact that there was so much organization behind it, again, um, struck a little bit of fear in the owners of the means of production, for lack of a better term. Another important strike which took place in 1912. It's called the Bread and Roses Strikes. Strike, um, essentially textile owners took on um, their employees in this case. Most of their employees were recent immigrants, mainly from like Eastern Europe, women, and eventually the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, steps in um, and tries to help them uh, basically collectively bargain with the textile owners. The important part to this strike, though, is this is not even remotely close to a general strike because the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, actually sat this one out um, because that organization was mostly white males and they didn't see common cause with recent Eastern European immigrants or women. So this one was not a general strike. So it shows some of the divisions um, in these early strikes. 1914 in Ludlow, Colorado, there was, of course, a strike of miners. They were massacred in mass um, by basically hired militia. Um, and the strike itself, as well as the massacre, sparks outrage. And it did lead to some changes in legislation within the state of Colorado. Those changes, however, did not extend um, to the national level. 1937, Flint, Michigan, um, basically General Motors is forced to take on the UAW, the United Auto Workers. The workers basically hold the plant um, through sit-ins. And despite um, various like tear gassings and stuff, they fully shut down production. This was a very important um, strike in terms of showing what, what people power can mean um, towards production, in this case of, of automobiles. And eventually GM would go on to produce other things as well for the war effort that was about to take place. 
other related events that were taking place essentially in the early 20th century that also got the elite uh, of the United States a little bit wary, um, of course, was the women's suffrage movement. Have to give a, a shout out there. There was also the Red Summer of 1919, where there was like racial tension, and that racial tension led to rampant white on black violence throughout the South. I mean, just mass lynchings were taking place, often perpetuated by the KKK. Um, however, we must uh, uh, talk about the agency, much of the African American population in the South, of course, was standing up to this a little bit. And this, of course, led to the elites being a little bit wary of what might be taking place in terms of race. We also have to talk real briefly in 1932 about the Bonus Army and these vets from World War I essentially basically petitioning and protesting against the government to receive the bonuses that they were promised and were never awarded um, uh, during for their service in World War I. Uh, that's just a few, um, probably too many off the top of my head. So we have some examples of effective strikes in the 19th and early 20th centuries. What are some other factors that led to the eventual legislation outlawing general strikes in the United States? So essentially, I mean, in addition to the slow, arduous progress made by workers, lower class women, African-American, African-Americans, marginalized immigrants, um, all just too briefly alluded to um, in the late 19th and early 20th century, conservative USers also manufactured uh, the Red Scare, the first Red Scare. Most people are familiar with the second one a little bit more, the McCarthyism stuff in the uh, post-World War II uh, era. But the first Red Scare is actually quite consequential in terms of labor, not just ideology as in the second Red Scare. Essentially, ultranationalism within World War I um, context. And again, World War I was an ultra-nationalist war. I, we usually attribute that to, of course, fascism in World War II. But all of the nation states that engaged in World War I were ultra-nationalists. That context mixed with the success of the Bolshevik Revolution um, in what would become the Soviet Union. And of course, the abject failure of the Allies to stop that revolution. Um, and this is important because this leads to like this, just like, I don't know, a great fear, like French Revolution style, great fear among the elites that somehow communism and perhaps and or anarchism were right around the corner here in, in the West and mostly in the United States. Um, essentially, there were like waves and waves of philosophical transition and political and transition movements that were spreading all throughout Western Europe and, of course, into the Soviet Union, um, as well as the impact of a number of great thinkers whose works were being like widely read here in the United States. This prompted what, what we, we can only call fascist responses from the elites of the West. So if we think about the impacts of the Emma Goldmans and the Antonio Gramsci's and the Eugene Debs and the Spanish syndicalists in Spain and 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 global common turn and so on, when you when you're an elite and you have um, a vested stake in maintaining control over the means of production and you have all of these thinkers ranging again from socialist to communist to anarchists and and everything in between, um, and they're being widely read and accepted, they're, you're scared. You're scared you're going to lose something. And this is where that red scare becomes manufactured. They used propaganda tactics, which of course are the, I mean, these are the usual tactics across time and space to begin to divide labor in response. So there's numerous examples. We only want to mention one example real quick. It's the example of, of uh, a dude named Edward Bernays. Um, loose relation to, uh, of course, the great um, psych psychiatrist or psychologist of the era, Sigmund Freud. Long story short, he produced a couple of works that made him famous and actually impacted U.S. history for a lot longer than people realized. They were called Crystallizing Public Opinion in 1923 and Propaganda in 1928. Um, Nick, I mean, I'm going to let you kind of jump back in now. I know you're the one asking the questions, but you know a little bit more about Edward Bernays than, than, than I do. What, what do you, what would you argue the impact of his work was? It's hard to overstate the impact of Edward Bernays and specifically his book, Propaganda, I think. I mean, it defines so much of modern society even to this day. So when you read it now, even things like influencers and like so forth, so much of what society has become, specifically like marketing and business uh, and shaping public opinion harkens back to 1928 and Edward Bernays' work, Propaganda. We, we should probably actually do a whole episode just on that because it's fascinating how much his ideas have just completely permeated modern society. I mean, globally, not just in the United States. 
Yeah, essentially, it was like this idea of using some of the psychological findings of his uncle, um, Sigmund Freud, right, like to basically coerce democratic outcomes. Like he was not a fan of the idea of democracy and free will and people being able to make their own choices and things along those lines. But he knew you can't like overturn that system in a post enlightenment world. So you have to give people the impression that they live in a democratic society while manipulating them to make the choices you want them to make. And essentially and like economically, right? Like how do you yeah. make people buy products and how do you like all that kind of stuff? Like anyone in marketing and business or economics Mm -hmm. absolutely ha that's like required reading you know yeah essentially it is like the reading on how to manipulate democratic societies into mm -hmm. basically de-democratizing themselves um which is a great irony of course anyway moving on other things that are taking place as we kind of like build towards what we want to talk about the illegalization of general strikes here in the united states um obviously without going into too much depth the great Dep depression is a huge deal uh, alongside the dust bowl dust bowl and of course mass immigration during the 1930s this does no flavor fa favor flavors favors for class antagonisms and obviously also creates xenophobia not just xenophobia of people like outside the united states but like inter-american xenophobia like people from different states obviously being a little bit suspect of each other because people are migrating many of them out west places like california this causes a lot lot of problems. Again, all types of immigration um, has led to like xenophobia over across time and space. Regardless, there were still certain labor gains that were made throughout the 1930s by the reactionary government of FDR and of course his New Deal policies. Um, the New Deal does a whole host of things, um, but aside from just job creation, welfare, and benefits in terms of specific labor, it, it includes the National Rela Labor Relations Act of 1935, where it basically legitimizes the role of unions in protection, protecting workers' rights. It allows for collective bargaining, and importantly, it allows for strikes and doesn't spend a lot of time like Met, like going through the details of what types of strikes are here or there. And that, again, that's important because the Taft-Hartley Act we're going to get to does do, does bother with a lot of that stuff. All of this is going to kind of be paused for just a second because of, a, of course, a very important event known as World War II. But the Cold War ideologies that were already a brew, brewing during the war itself among the United States elite presents an opportunity for them to start constructing us versus them paradigms to basically equate union power to Soviet aggression and win over the unwashed masses and vilify organized labor. This is wildly important. Again, this is back to that propaganda campaign. So even before the war is won, and we, we, we cannot forget that the Soviet Union does much of the heavy lifting to win the war. In fact, probably more of the heavy lifting than anyone in the West wants to give them credit for. Regardless, what this means, though, is that there is now going to be, and everyone knows what the Cold War is, or at least all our listeners do, an us versus them paradigm on a, on a global level. But what the elites are going to try and do is then bring that down to the national level, that anything that is associated with organized labor is Soviet. And of course, this is going to lead to that second Red Scare. But again, it happens even before the second Red Scare. We're talking about like in 1943, there's a national coal miner strike. Most labor unions adhere to a no-strike pledge during World War II, but John L. Lewis president of the UMW, the United Mine Workers, told FDR that his men were working under unfair conditions and would not be bound by any such pledge. And despite Roosevelt's appeals to the miners' patriotic responsibility to keep up their coal production during wartime, half a million miners went on strike in April of 43. On May 1st, FDR issued Executive Order 9340, which then placed the coal miners under the control of the federal government, which again brings in that kind of nationalist ethos, this patriotism that the workers should kind of sacrifice their own well-being for this greater cause. In this case, it's World War II, but later on, that greater cause, of course, is going to defeat the Reds, right? There's also going to be a strike wave in 1945, um, basically through 46, where depending on your source, between two and five million USers go on strike from industries as diverse as like film workers to meat packers to auto manufacturers and, and so many others in between. So that's, I mean, that's essentially the context where we get to um, Taft-Hartley. So yeah, you just laid out about half a century, right? Basically context of relations between laborers and employers and at times the federal government gets involved right 
the government had finally had enough. So explain how they effectively made general strikes illegal. So, I mean, I brought it up at least twice at this point. It is commonly known as the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, where essentially the elite classes um, win and U.S. labor has never recovered. And this is important. We've, they've never recovered. Organized labor in the United States has not recovered since 1947. Essentially proposed in the Senate by Robert Taft and a more oppressive version was proposed in the House by Fred Hartley. Um, and, and these proposals were, of course, supported by big business and a combined version of this eventually made it out of Congress. Um, and it becomes the Taft-Hartley Act. The president at that time, Harry S. Truman, actually vetoed the act. Um, he's obviously a very controversial figure for a host of decisions you made, but in this case, he's on the side of, 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 of vetoing the act. Unfortunately for all of us, Congress overrode his veto handily. It wasn't even really close. Um, somehow also getting support of the democratic party, which of course we don't have time to dig into all the political production, uh, uh pr production corruption between the different parties and how they shift, um, views over time and space on certain topics, Republicans and Democrats. But we, we, we can talk about it like this, essentially the legislative branch, Republicans and Democrats will always work together or have historically worked together to maintain like the status of elite corporations and businesses and so on and so forth. And this is just another example of that, this cross partisan lines. So that that's, that's key. Officially, what this act is going to be called when it when it when it becomes um, when it becomes basically law is the Labor Man Management Relations Act of 1947. And I'll just read a, like a brief blurb about it, which makes it sound not that bad. But let's talk about it. And I quote, this act pro is to promote the full flow of commerce, to prescribe the legitimate rights of both employees and employers and the relations affecting commerce, to provide orderly and peaceful procedures preventing, uh, for preventing the interference by either with the legitimate rights of the other, to protect the rights of individual employees in their relations with labor organizations whose activities affect commerce, to define and prescribe practices on the part of labor and management which affect commerce, and are in a I can never pronounce this word, inimical to the general welfare and to the protect the rights of the public in connection with labor disputes affecting commerce. So right off the bat, we see how many times the word commerce makes an appearance. And even though it doesn't necessarily outright here say a whole bunch of negative things about like labor um, or the employees in this case, this idea that essentially commerce, making money, the exchange of goods should come first and foremost in all sorts of like understanding of how how work should, should, should provide for all of us. This is key, right? This is just another example in U.S. history where it is like, in this case, products over people, right? Anything you want to add actually before, before I kind of continue? Cause I feel like I'm. No, I think that you nailed it when you just the amount of times that commerce was mentioned in that paragraph, right? To define and proscribe practices on the part of labor and management, which affect commerce, right? So it sounds like, oh, that sounds good. But what it's really doing is it's making federal law about how workers and employers can negotiate between themselves, right? Which is interesting. Well, and essentially it's then the government's job to ensure like the consistent flow of commerce, which again, like... Mm -hmm. Cash rules everything around me. We use that term all, all of the time, but like there's bigger things in the world than can I, can I buy shit essentially? And that's, a, I mean, that's what we're doing here, right? Like, like it really is like, it's all about the flow of goods. And I, I, I'm sure the one or two capitalist uh, listeners we, we garner for each of these episodes is rolling their eyes. But like, really, when your life is dedicated to the buying and exchange of goods and that like, I mean, really, like you really need to reevaluate your, your, your life choices and your ethics at a certain point. But, but, but I'm going off the rails a little bit. Let's get, let's get back in here. Essentially, it sounds good on paper in some way, shape, or form, but a whole host of the um, the things I just talked about in the early 20th century, these types of forms of labor organization end up being banned throughout specific language in the act. So in some, I'm only going to go through them like real briefly, but essentially one of the things that ends up being banned to ensure that commerce is always flowing because that's all that matters is that unions going on strike in solidarity with other unions is banned. This is, of course, literally the almost the definition of a general strike, right? Like unions going on strike in solidarity with other unions. I mean, why is that part so important, Nick? Like why is banning that in Taft-Hartley so important? 
because if you prevent that, right, two unions from different industries going on strike together, you've essentially, I mean, just completely decimated the power of labor together. Or even within industry, just like with like Pullman, um, if you have mm-hmm. like the people that make like the railroad cars going on strike in unison with the rail workers, the ones that are building the railroads themselves, right? Like that's, we could argue that's part of the whole production process, but regardless, like that's now illegal. Can't mm-hmm. do it. Can't do it. Um, okay. Jurisdictional striking is also Banned. So unions get to essentially, in case you're what the listeners are wondering what I what that means, this jurisdictional thing is where unions would go on strike to basically get them to decide what type of work would be assigned. So essentially the workers get to assign their own work. That's now banned. Workers no longer get to assign their own work. That's going to be decided by like management. Okay. Secondary boycotts are also banned. So that means that unions can no longer boycott products of businesses that do business with their target. So sometimes even if the if the if the workers weren't on strike at their own place of business, they'd stop buying products of people that were on strike somewhere else within their own industry. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. All strikes now required an 80 day notice. Why does that even matter? What do you think? I mean, this provides notice for the employers and their c- customers and any related industries, right? That they now have time to prepare. I liken it to like, you know, you can't protest now unless you have a permit from the city, right? To gather kind of the same thing, right? It, it lets them know what's going to happen so that they can be prepared. I mean, honestly, to minimize the impact of the strike. On commerce. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course. Um, Federal employees were no longer allowed to strike at all. So just basically banning them from fighting for their own labor rights. If you work for, of course, the Fed. So there's that. Union leaders also now had to file affidavits, essentially distancing themselves, distancing themselves from communism. Again, we're moving towards the second red scare here. Essentially, and here's the language, the amendments required union leaders to file affidavits with the United States Department of Labor declaring that they were not supporters of the Communist Party and had no relationship with any organization seeking the overthrow of the U.S. government by force or by any illegal or unconstitutional means. Um, This part, however, was later overturned in the Supreme Court in 65, but it was a thing for, what is that, 18 years and through the entire Second Red Scare. Um, Other things that end up being banned by Taft-Hartley or changed because of Taft-Hartley Employers are now given extended right to oppose unions. In other words, now in, like specific employers can oppose unions within their industry or within their corporations or within their businesses or things along those lines. And of course, that's the idea, like uh, we're turning the employers or these corporations into basically citizens, um, which of course they're manned by the few, not the many, but their, their power is much more. Well, this one was important because prior to this, you sorry employers were forced to remain neutral so if there were unionizing efforts going on at a workplace they basically just had to sit back and see what happened right but as a result of this and which everyone knows now if you've ever been involved in like or watched the news about large unionizing efforts as a result of this they now have the right to oppose actively oppose unionizing within their workplace like posting anti-union stuff and having anti-union training and actively attacking unionizing efforts and et cetera. So all of those things that we see now going on at Starbucks and Amazon and so forth, that's all allowed now as a result of Taft Hartley. Which is extremely unethical on so many on so many levels. And again, I'm sure someone there is literally pulling up their bootstraps while listening to this. Well, they own it. It's theirs. Like, but that's not the thing. Like, they own nothing without the workers. Like, that, that's the point, right? And so, like, we see, like, again, the government skewing favor towards the elite in in, in the United States. All right. Another thing from Taft-Hartley, federal jurisdiction was granted to enforce collective bargaining instead of more radical measures if deemed appropriate. So essentially the government during a strike can step in and more or less end the strike um, through collective bargaining efforts, force the workers themselves to basically bargain, usually from points of weakness, um, rather than allowing them to maintain their more radical measures. Or even before strikes start, they'll basically look to collective, collective bargaining. Again, this is not... To, for the benefit of the workers, this is to ensure commerce never stops. We got to keep that money flowing. All right. 
other things that are key here. Unions end up being prohibited from contributing to political campaigns. This effectively removed the voice of organized labor from um, politics. This was in effect until the Citizens United ruling in 2010. But essentially, for the better part of decades, where a lot of wealth is going to be built, a lot of our economic historians know that like 60s, 70s, 80s, when the wealth gap like just is accelerated, it's partially because of this. Unions could not contribute to political campaigns. In the meantime, lobbyists from literally every industry that's ever existed can contribute all they want. This is, again, extremely, extremely biased ruling. It also authorized the president to intervene in strikes or potential strikes that create a natural national emergency. And Nick knows a little bit about a couple of the great examples of this taking place. What are these of this last part of the act? So it's interesting because we'll start first with Truman, who vetoed the act itself, right, the the Taft-Hartley Act, but then it got overturned by Congress. So even though he opposed it, he invoked it 10 times during his presidency to try to put an end to strikes that were going on. Um, It's been enacted, uh, sorry, invoked 35 times since it was introduced in 1947. As best as my research can discover, I think the last time that it was actually invoked was in 2002. George W. Bush invoked it to reopen the ports on the West Coast. Um, 10,500 longshoremen were collectively striking and they essentially were locked out uh, from the ports. So there were hundreds of ships waiting off the West Coast of the United States that they refused to process. Bush invoked Taft-Hartley basically said it was a matter of national security because supplies weren't coming into essentially the entire West Coast. And so he forced them back to work, essentially. But the most famous case of this, I think, probably is Ronald Reagan and the air traffic controllers. And this takes place in the early 80s. In 1981, over 13,000 air traffic controllers demanded safer, safer working conditions including a reduced 32-hour work week and some salary increases. And if you know anything about air traffic control work, it's highly, highly stressful. Um, Like, just imagine, you know, you're working all the time watching these maps, right, Uh, radar screens, et cetera, making sure airplanes don't crash into people, loaded with hundreds and hundreds of civilians, right? Hugely stressful. So they were fighting for a reduced hour work week and increase in salary. Um, The negotiations weren't going well. And on August 3rd, the Professional Air Traffic Controller Organization, known as PATCO, declared a strike. Now, this is a problem because they are FAA employees, which is a federal organization. And so they, as a result of Taft-Hartley, are forbidden to strike. It's a violation of federal law. So they violated their employment contracts the second that they went on strike. President Reagan demanded that they all return to work, but only 1,300 of them did so. He then said, you know, you have 48 hours to return or else you will be terminated. And he followed through with his threat. On August 5th, he fired the remaining 11,000 workers who refused to return to work. Um, And there's a long series of history of what happened to those people. And really actually kind of interesting about how they filled those, you know, 11,000 jobs, et cetera. But that's a whole other uh, details. Now, this seems kind of innocuous because you're like, okay, so what? These 11,000 air traffic controllers got fired. Like, that doesn't really impact me. But this is a watershed moment in the history of United States labor because it really shifted public opinion and it kind of created the view that striking workers were selfish and aggressive sort of villains, right? So that's one thing. But the other thing is it also emboldened employers, right? This is national news for weeks, right? It emboldened employers to realize that they could just fire workers instead of bargaining, instead of negotiating, right? Instead of like, okay, I'll increase your pay 25 cents an hour and let's talk about benefits and so forth. It basically gave them the confidence to just straight fire anyone that was a member of a union that was trying to uh, negotiate and just start over, right? No matter how detrimental that might be. And I think it's important to say that it's not just this in 1981, that in general, the Taft-Hartley Act contributed over time to the shifting of public opinion on unions and laborers and striking workers. Where like you talked about, there were so many examples in the 1800s and early 1900s, but after Taft-Hartley, 
really the general public starts to view striking workers as sort of aggressive and selfish and egotistical. And they become like sort of the villains of the economy because the language is now there that they are jeopardizing commerce, right? That it's the workers' fault that the economy isn't growing. It's the workers' fault, you know, that there's inflation. And like the worker becomes the scapegoat when before like that discourse definitely was did not exist. I remember as like a kid, like I didn't care about any of this, uh, these other industries because I was a child, mm-hmm. but I did like watching my sports, right? My football yeah. and my base. And I remember always like the media would paint the players when they went on strike, the baseball players or the football players or whatever. They're the bad guys, right? Like there was even a movie, what was it called? The Replacements, where like the, the guys that are on strike <laughs> are the bad guys and Keanu Reeves, the scab is the good guy. Like, yeah. like, like. Like that was the type of propaganda being produced. And I, I bought in. I'm like, well, why? What? And in that industry, of course, the whole excuse is, well, they're already making hundreds of thousands in the 80s and 90s. And now, of course, millions, if not millions of dollars. Why do they have the right to go on strike? Well, because, again, in, in comparison to like what they produce, they're actually still not getting as much as those owners of the means of production. That's a whole different argument I feel like getting into. But that was like a personal thing that I remember for like growing up again in the 90s. I'm like, man, like they, these guys are greedy. Like the workers. Like, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. my example. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've kind of gone through like a all too brief history of, of the idea of general strike. And we actually we could actually argue that maybe a general strike never even fully came to fruition. The closest one I think we touched on was Pullman. But regardless, we talked about these these strikes in U.S. history, um, the terms of union involvement um, and how Taft Hartley affects these. Why does this even matter, though? Like we're, we're in 2022, 1947 is decades ago. Why does this matter? What are the material and ideal costs of Taft Hartley? In other words, why are we even bothering with this episode? Um, I mean, there's an important note that, that that Nick and I both wanted to make here. I guess I'll make it before I kind of open this these questions up to him. Keep in mind that many of the following consequences that we're talking about, these economic and financial consequences um, and even class-based consequences are also products of other factors. So there, Taft-Hartley is not the sole reason. It's a reason. It's not the sole reason. Things have taken place over the last, uh, whatever, six, seven decades at this point. Globalization, neoliberal policies, economic policies, Reaganomics. Um, rapidly changing industries, moving from like more industrial to more um, communicative to more tech, et cetera. Like those changes also matter. But again, Taft-Hartley's like ideal and material constructs also probably play a role in some of those changes. Regardless of the cause, all of these things can be traced back to the few having more than the many, especially when it comes to labor, wages, and consumptions. In simple terms, the owners of the means of production, I hate using that 1800s term, but I couldn't actually think of a better one for right now, um, are still dictating um, through, of course, their puppets, whether those puppets are bought lobbyists or bought politicians or whatever. So in terms of like social movement, how has Taft-Hartley hurt social movement in general, Nick? I think it's important to note, going back to your, you know, sort of disclaimer on globalization and neoliberalism and how the economic landscape of the United States and the globe clearly has changed drastically since 1947. But I think it's important that we ask ourselves sort of the chicken and the egg question, right? Like, would those things have developed as they did, neoliberalism, et cetera, if Taft-Hartley hadn't been enacted, right? I think that Taft-Hartley really opened things up opened sort of the floodgates for those kinds of economic policies to be implemented, right? If workers had more rights, we probably wouldn't have seen uh, those things nearly as, you know, rampant as they became. So I think that's important to note. But regarding your question on social movement, right? One of the important things that happened as a result of Taft-Hartley was just the complete destruction of workers' solidarity, right? Um, The... I think it's really difficult for people nowadays to imagine a time when unions were really, really powerful, right? And unions were such an important part of people's lives, right? Workers and their families, like unions were one of the institutions, just like education and all of these things, right? They were one of the social institutions that really were part of sort of just the milieu of daily life. If we go back, you know, a few decades. And like now it's impossible, not a few, uh, probably half a century, right? 50, 60, 70 years before Taft-Hartley, essentially. But now people like that's completely out the window. And like we talked about earlier, people have these negative connotations associated with 
unions and union which is kind of weird i'm gonna cut in for just a second but like in short listeners right like i, I workers are still abused like, like that's the problem that's what this episode's about and I'm, we're not saying it's good but what little gains we they, they we have made over time and space were all because of unions right the reason a weekend exists in the world is because of union work like you they created weekends or the 40 hour or why kids aren't being exploited in workplaces and things like that's all unions did all of those things so there were gains even those of you with negative connotations i'm sure you still love your fishing trips on the weekend we'll thank a union right like yeah yeah exactly so solidarity among workers was decimated right this entire worker community you know support etc was just gone and as a result you know, employers gained much more power and they were able to, on a larger scale, treat employees individually, right? So Mm -hmm. one person got a raise and the other person didn't get a raise and so forth. And like they could do illegal work practices with one employee and not another because Mm -hmm. the employees really didn't have this venue, uh, the union, right, to share these experiences. So employers Mm -hmm. were able to essentially get away with so many more things as a result of this. In addition, right, this created much more competition among the worker because the union wasn't in charge of negotiating salaries and so forth with the employer. It was now up to each individual worker. So, you know, Bob's getting paid whatever, 20 bucks an hour, and Harry's getting paid 25 bucks an hour. They aren't necessarily talking about this, right? In fact, the huge taboo about discussing salary and so forth in the workplace comes as a result of this kind of action. And so they don't know, know, right? What? Uh, it is office space. I have a meeting with the Bobs. <laughs> right. Yeah. So employers have much more power, I guess. Right. So and much more competition among the workers. So you're competing with your fellow worker. You know, you're trying to outcompete them so that you can get the raise and you can get the promotion and so forth. When in the day of unions, it wasn't really like that. Right. The workers, the, the workers had much more solidarity and they were working together much more than they were working against each other. Right. It was much more the workers versus the employers and trying to do right by the worker than it was the worker versus the worker, right? The other thing that happened is the unions, their power and their resources were completely gutted, right? So if you ask yourselves, how were people able to afford going on strike, you know, back in the day? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because the unions had incredible power and incredible resources. So when you went on strike, they would pay you so that you could support your family, right? They still continued. When you were on strike, they were paying wages to you So even though you weren't working, you could still afford to eat and support your family and pay your bills. And also there was much more of an environment of mutual aid back then, right? So when the union workers were striking, they would still get together on a regular basis and help each other out, right? If someone's family had medical bills and so forth, right, they would all come together and support each other through these uh, periods of striking. And I guess I want to mention, even if they weren't striking, they would still come together and support each other. No, that's good. I was reminded, you just reminded me of another example that we did bring up, didn't bring up. I forget the year because I we didn't we didn't research for it, but long story short, there was a strike in Cripple Creek, Colorado back when there were it was a mining town. And essentially the miners went on strike, of course, against their their corporate overlords, so to speak. And in this case, the town itself like helped them like afford to live while they were on strike. So the whole town, like the shop would feed them basically, I I don't want to say for free, but it was on credit essentially. And the hotels would kind of put them up. And basically the whole town itself, this idea infected the whole town of mutual or Cripple Creek with this mutual aid. I said infected, like it was a bad thing, but like affected this (laughs) mutual aid essentially. And they basically kept these miners afloat while they, while they went on strike for their rights essentially. And again, you need something to eat, go to the store, they're going to hook you up. You need a a bed to stay in, go to this inn. It's an, and, and 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 it worked. So in this case, we don't call it, it was like cross industry, but but specific to this town. But that was the culture that was bred at the time, where the workers matter more than the corporation. And me, myself, and I, it was mutual aid. So I mean, that was just another one that came to the top of my head while you were talking. Yeah, for sure. Also, as a result of you know the entire changing of the economic circumstances of everyone in the past you know hundred years. There's much more now worker dependency on the system overall, right? We are now consumers to a level that we never were, you know, back in the 1940s and 1950s and so forth. And workers have become much, much more specialized, right? The the expansion of industry and technology has created hyper specialization, which we're all aware of, right? But as a result of hyper specialization, it also creates hyper dependency. We're all dependent on one another much more than we were before. 
And Jared's story of Cripple Creek actually is a really good example, right? Where the striking workers all live in this little town in the mountains. And so you could go in and talk to, you know, the waitress and the chef and the owner of the diner on the corner and say, hey, you know, we're striking and we need food and that can get taken care of. But you can't go into Starbucks today and be like, hey, I'm on strike and I'm hungry. Can like you hook me up? Like that's <laughs> yeah. not happening. Yeah, right? absolutely. Just the globalization and specialization that exists now in today's economy, completely different culture than existed back then. Well, and right. I think we forget how important hyper-specialization is towards creating dependency. Like most of us, because of our education and all these things that have, have be- our products of hyper-specialization don't have the skills to do much anything else to provide for ourselves, which makes us dependent upon this commerce. So yes, when I'm like, when I'm mad because I see somebody marching around strike or whatever, uh, yeah, most recently in Valencia, Spain airport, where we had to wait like an hour in line because the guys were striking and wouldn't put my bags on the plane. Th- that was me being selfish. Like rather than looking at the workers, even that like tinge of irritation, I felt like that was a selfishness. But that's the point I'm making. I'm hyper specialized. I can't do it myself. I'm actually also not allowed to do it myself because of like whatever, a whole bunch of safety regulations. But that's part of it, right? It's merely this kind of like cog in this large chain. And I don't have a lot of abilities or even freedoms to do anything outside of it. This idea of living in the land of the free and the, I can't like, let's say I am on strike and I need some water. I can't just go out to wherever I want and dig a well and get my own water. I'm not allowed to do that, right? Like, nor do I have the skills to do that. Yeah, and it creates this culture of ego and selfishness. Like you said, like we can reflect, right? I was there with you. And like, we are two of the biggest supporters of labor on the planet. But we were both standing there like, oh my God, just put my bag on the plane so we can get on the plane, right? Like in the moment, you're like, Jesus, just do the thing. Even though I support the laborers, like I just want to get on the plane, right? But we have to understand that like, because we felt no solidarity with them as workers. And that's the entire point, right? That this sense of solidarity that workers across industry, across country, et cetera, felt with one another, like that's been completely eroded by the policies that have been enacted over the years, right? Perfect example. The other thing that really people can't relate to anymore, but that was that existed when unions were much more prominent was job security. Right. Mm -hmm. If you were a member of a large union and you had a job, that was a secure job. Right. Like getting a union job was like one of the highest things that you could achieve if you were just a regular laborer. Right. Because that was basically completely you could be secure for the rest of your life if you got the right union job. Right. With benefits for the rest of your life and a retirement plan that paid well and like all these things. Right. If you got a union job from one of the big unions, like you are guaranteed work for a really, really long time and a good job. Now that uh, we all know, right, that's completely gone, right? The precariousness that we face now as laborers is a direct result of the absolute destruction of the power of unions over the past century uh, in the United States, right? And I guess we keep saying the U.S., but similar things have happened in uh, other industrialized countries as well. But we're just talking about Taft-Hartley because it's such a striking example of just one policy that was enacted that had all of these ramifications in this country, right? What does Taft Hartley mean for like the acceleration of the widening class gaps that we've seen? Again, for example, like the the class gap in the United States is the largest in world history right now. You're Mm -hmm. living, right? Like, I don't know what example, what example do I always use in class? Julius Caesar and a Roman slave or servant were closer in material conditions than you ever will be with your elite. Like that, like it's, it's huge. So we're going to put these up on the screen. If you're listening to this in podcast form, you're not going to see them, but I'll put them in the show notes and you can check out uh, this episode on the website. But the first one is a chart that's showing productivity by essentially wages, right? Hourly compensation by wages. And we see that wages followed, I mean, mirrored productivity until about the 1970s. And then we see a massive change where compensation, the growth essentially flattens off almost completely, but productivity increases, uh, continues to increase linearly and really, really uh, massively, right? So we see that productivity continues to increase, but the worker, the wages, uh, don't get the same share of that productivity. And this is just a result of the erosion of the power that laborers had, right? When they were in unions and they could collectively bargain, et cetera, when there was power in numbers and they had power to negotiate, they could get a bigger piece of the pie, uh, essentially. Now, the next chart is showing annual pay increases um, for the top 1% versus the bottom 
90%. Essentially, it says wages for the top 1% grew 138% since 1979, while wages for the bottom 90% only grew 15%. This is showing the widening gap between the 1% and the bottom 90%, right? And this is a direct result of laborers losing their power to negotiate collectively. Then the third one that's really interesting is how the decline in union membership mirrors income gains of the top 10% almost exactly, right? So if we go to on this timeline, you know, right before Taft-Hartley was enacted, we see that the share of income of the top 10% was about 30% and union membership was also about 30%. Fast forward to basically modern times, we see that the share of income to the top 10% is almost 50% and membership share has plummeted to about 10%. So over 30% of workers were members of a union when Taft-Hartley was enacted. Now that is down to about 6%. I mean, that just shows you the complete erosion of the power of unions since Taft-Hartley was enacted. So those are just a few examples of how this has contributed to the widening wage gap, right? And just incredible inequality and stratification that exists. Like Jared says, it's the greatest point in history. Right now, you are living through it. Well, I don't mean it's great as in like we like it. It's the largest. Unfortunately, right. <laughs> it is. The, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Right. So here's the thing, right? Like we've all kind of, most of us and most of our listeners, at least the demographics that we've tracked, are kind of products of this vilified union era, right? Like we were all taught how bad they are. And we've all probably worked in a workplace at one point um, that they were vilified by like the employer and and know your, you know, know your rights. And it's all about individualism. So we're all products of that. So here's the thing. Were unions even like that great, weren't they? they corrupt, right? That's what I was always told. They were always corrupt. So, I mean, what do you think of that? Like, I mean, I, mean, I think that this, this is the, the number one argument, right? Unions are corrupt anyways. Why should we support them, right? It's the yeah. union heads that are making all the money. Of course, they are were large institutions that were populated by human beings. So yes, they weren't perfect, right? There was obviously, anytime we get a large institution that has any kind of power, there's going to be some level of corruption, right? But I think that this line of inquiry that is like, you know, weren't unions corrupt is a direct result of the propaganda that was made mm -hmm. possible, you know, by this new discourse created by Taft-Hartley and that continued all the way through right to Reagan and the air, the air traffic controllers and so forth. There's the propaganda in the media since then has really just vilified the worker, not even just the striking worker and not even just the union, but I mean, the worker overall has just yeah. become vilified, right? And mm -hmm. definitely unions have become vilified. Now, mm -hmm. of course, that's because there is some truth, right? Yes, of course, there was corruption in unions uh, at different times and different places than different unions, right? But the fact that there's a kernel of corruption combined with this propaganda, this discourse that's so anti-union and so anti-worker, I mean, it just gets out of control to where people just believe unions are like the devil, right? We're, I mean, is, is any of this corruption even remotely akin to what takes place with things like Enron? And like, it's not even close, right? Or but politicians, the, right? Or politicians, right? And here's the thing that I think a lot of people forget. Who's more accountable to workers, like union leaders or CEOs, elected officials, and other elites? We already know that the union leaders are much more accountable, right? They actually have a say-so in what's going on with that leadership. Whereas like a corporate CEO answers literally to know, but somebody could say shareholders, but even that's probably an like that's an abstract idea. They're, they 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 don't answer to anyone, and that's kind of the point. Anyway, um, I think the accountability factor unions um, are much more accountable to the worker than anybody else in any part of the industry. Like you said, right? There are plenty of examples of unions being successful, and like like you said, if you like your weekend, think a union. If you like working forty hours a week instead of ninety, think a union. If you don't want little kids working in mines, you know. Workers' compensation, yeah, think exactly. a union, right? Yeah. Like OSHA regulations, which again, again, some business owners like, I don't want to. Well, yeah, like, yes, you should keep your workers safe. Actually, one other thing that I thought of that we don't even have on here because I just thought of it right now is pension plans, right? Unions, yeah. yep. when they were powerful, also controlled the workers' pension plans, right? Which is where a lot of the corruption uh, came from. But as a result, workers had much, much, much better retirement plans than they do now. 
And Taft-Hartley and other legislation basically just gutted that possibility. Since unions lost power and resources, the shift of retirement plans got shifted basically onto the individual. And yes, some corporations mm-hmm. provide as benefits, you know, they'll contribute to your 401k or whatever, but it basically just got outsourced to the individual to figure out your retirement on your own or rely specifically on social security, right? How much of that anti-union boomer generation do you think has some fat pension that they got from their, their, their yeah, it's cognitive dissonance oh, yeah, anyway. Completely. All right, let's keep moving, let's keep moving. All right, so... Uh, regardless of Taft-Hartley, and I'm going to ask a question as if I were a commenter, haven't some labor gains been made since 1947, like in the steel strike of 59 or the postal strike of 70 or even the UPS strike of 97? Yes. I mean, the answer is yes, right? And so we'll just do one example, which is the UPS strike in 1997, Essentially, I won't even go into all what they were striking for, but essentially it was wage related mostly. Um, and there were 185,000 UPS workers that were unionized that went on strike. Um, it lasted for 16 days. It ended up costing UPS $600 million uh, in losses. And interestingly, throughout this period, the chairman of UPS was basically begging Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, to invoke Taft Hartley. And he was arguing that as a result of UPS being so important to commerce in so many different ways, that actually was a national issue at this point. And they were using all kinds of things to try to pull on people's heartstrings, like blood banks were complaining that they were having to throw away blood because it couldn't get delivered because of UPS strike and like all these things, right? Clinton never did. He never uh, invoked Taft-Hartley, though, like I said, it only lasted 16 days. So who knows what would have happened had it lasted much longer. But they were successful. In the end, UPS bent to the union and gave them essentially everything that they asked for. So this is one example. Like you said, there are examples still of unions being successful, right, in negotiating for the worker and so forth. However, it's just in this case specifically was like one group of workers versus one specific corporation, right? And so the general strike now being essentially illegal and unions prevented from having solidarity with other unions, the union is basically limited to this type of action, right? So the best we can hope for as a result of a strike in the United States is one group of workers versus one corporation seeing some kind of gain. But as a means of social change, that, that opportunity has been just completely gutted by the legislation in the United States, right? So if anyone's like, well, we need a general strike to really make change in the country. Like that's impossible as a result of federal legislation that exists, right? There, that's just not, you need to explore different avenues for social change because the general strike in the United States just isn't a possibility at all, right? The federal government has the means through which to completely, it's just destroyed any possibility of that as a reality. Well, and it's sure as shit not going to be introduced in the legislative branch, right? The vast majority of those politicians, regardless of party, have a vested stake in one industry or another, whether that's through their actual shares or prior ownership of the business itself, or simply being bought and paid for by wildly corrupt lobbying groups. Of course, unions no longer have the resources to lobby effectively. They now can legally lobby again, fine, but they don't have the resources anymore because they are now decades behind in acquiring those resources because they weren't allowed to for what, six, uh, I don't even remember how many. Well, that's an important point is that Taft-Hartley made it illegal for unions to commit to political campaigns. It also was illegal at the time for corporations to contribute to political campaigns. Citizens United overruled both of those things. So as a result of Citizens United lobby, or sorry, unions can now contribute to political campaigns and corporations can now contribute contribute to political campaigns. But as we've seen, the unions were completely decimated, right? They have no funding anymore. So it doesn't even matter. They basically, it was just said, okay, yeah, let's let unions do that because we know they have no say whatsoever. They have zero power and zero money to be contributing. But corporations obviously have billions and billions of dollars. So they now get to, uh, because they they didn't have their resources decimated as a result of Taft-Hartley, clearly the opposite effect happened. 
But even even for those decades where technically the corporation couldn't, the CEOs were free yep. to do whatever they want. And of course, who has the means to contribute to a political campaign for the in 1985? Right, a CEO of Goldman Sachs or a union leader whose ability to provide for himself is completely gone at this point. Right. So that that that's one of those things that I think like, oh well, it was equal. They both it wasn't equal. It was absolutely mm-hmm. not equal. Anyway, regardless, any legislative change at this point because of the lack of general strike would be specific to one industry, perhaps, and even that's kind of iffy. Um, and it would have to occur not, of course, through it wouldn't be introduced in the legislature by any stretch of the imagination. It would have to take place in the judicial branch. Um, and of course, as of 2022, if this current judicial branch, at least at the highest level, is not willing to grant women bodily autonomy, it sure as shit's not going to grant workers any sort of rights. So- yeah, I just think it's important for people to understand, A, I mean, I think the most important thing is to understand why you think unions are bad, right? That's a completely manufactured propaganda that, that needs to be investigated. But it's also important to understand all of the things that exist within the United States, and specifically here, we focused on Taft-Hartley in 1947, on why a general strike in the U.S. is impossible and exactly how the power of unions got attacked and eroded away over the past century. Like, this isn't an accident. This was very clearly calculated by the federal government to ensure, you know, like we've been saying all along, commerce was able to continue um, at the detriment of individual laborers and unions. So I think it's just important for us to understand. Before we go, I do want to give a shout out to a podcast, Working Class History. Their entire podcast is going super, super deeply into all of this history, and it's absolutely incredible. So you can check them out, uh, workingclasshistory.com. Thank you for listening to that episode. If you enjoyed it, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. I am Nick. I'm Jared. Later.